Hey, it's Dan. I'm really excited to share with you that the Association of Healthcare Journalists has just announced their annual award winners. And our episode, Inside Big Health Insurer's Side Hustle, won first place in the audio reporting category. We're extremely honored to be recognized by our healthcare reporting peers. To commemorate we're rerunning the episode this week, a story about what can go wrong when some of America's largest companies outsource the management of their health benefits to large insurance carriers. Stay tuned till the end for updates to the story since it aired last fall. America's biggest health insurance companies have a side hustle most of us have never heard of. Deep inside Fortune 500 companies, labor unions, and state capitals, major insurers moonlight as middlemen. Your third-party administrator. Third-party administrator. Third-party administrator. Big employers hire these insurers to run their health plans, paying them handsomely, and entrusting them to manage hundreds of billions of dollars. But a recent federal court ruling and other revelations raise questions about whether all that trust is dangerously misplaced. Today, from deep inside one of healthcare's blackest boxes and the studio at the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Trade Offs. On today's show, I'm joined by senior producer Leslie Walker, who we have to thank for this pretty weird and wonky journey we're about to go on. Hey, Leslie. Hey, Dan. You're welcome. And I'm sorry. Uh, And I'm kind of thinking we should probably change your title to Senior Spelunker because today's episode really is this kind of quest where you're plunging into a deep, dark corner of healthcare. Funnily enough, that was my childhood nickname. (laughs) (laughs) So I've got my headlamp, my trail mix, my Keens. I'm ready to roll. So Dan, like a lot of sagas in healthcare, this one starts with a bill and a pretty perplexed patient. My name is Sandy Peters. I'm 71 and I live in Western North Carolina. Now, Sandy's a retiree, but she still gets her health benefits through the candy company Mars that employed her husband for a long time. For over 25 years. And for a lot of those years, every month, Sandy went to the chiropractor. Every time, she paid about six bucks. The charge never changed until February 2014. That's when her tab more than doubles to 14 bucks for the exact same treatment she'd always gotten. I figured somebody had made an honest mistake. She checks with her chiropractor, who confirms, nope, her office billed the usual amount. So Sandy figures it must be an error by Aetna, the insurance company that acts as the third-party administrator for Mars and their health plan. You will find three Aetna benefit statements. She writes Aetna a letter. That depict upcharging. Aetna basically blows Sandy off. She goes to the chiropractor in March, and again, another 14 bucks. And that was a real bad move, Dan, because there's something Aetna doesn't yet know about Sandy. Um, yeah, I'm kind of like a dog with a bone. (laughs) Tenacious, I think's the term. This lady grabs her pen. To Aetna Life Insurance Company. She gets to work. To the customer resolution team. Firing off letters left and right. I cannot even begin to describe misappropriation of patient I continue benefits. to dispute how Aetna paid. I probably wrote 12 letters in 2014. March 10th, June 9th, August 14th, October 26th. It is time the bogus claim is exposed. And the same runaround. Damn, my hand hurts just thinking about all that letter writing. Like you write letters anymore? <laughs> <laughs> So Sandy's getting more and more suspicious. She goes from calling the issue a discrepancy in the spring to a swindle and a fraud by the fall. Wait wait a minute. Lots of us have gotten angry with our insurance companies, but this is eight extra dollars, maybe three Milky Ways. Uh, Why was Sandy so upset? Yeah, I mean, to be fair, Sandy is retired on a fixed income, but from the start, she just felt like this whole thing was plain wrong. And it was never about her money. It was about the candy company's money. She was only paying like eight extra bucks a month, like you said. But Mars was picking up the rest of the bill, paying nearly $30 more. 
we thought that we could lose our health care with Mars, uh, which that's costly. How many companies today give their retirees health care benefits? And Mars does. She worried the company might stop covering retiree health benefits if this kind of thing was really happening company-wide. And what did Mars say? Did they ever respond to any of those letters? Sandy says Mars never did directly reply. They just forwarded a letter from Aetna saying everything was above board, which she assumed just meant Mars wasn't worried. I, I was shocked at that. Now, Dan, I think it helps here to pause Sandy's story for a second and explain the relationship between Mars and Aetna a bit more. Because it's a relationship almost every big employer in the country has, and it's pretty surprising. So Mars actually acts as its own health insurer. That means Mars is on the hook to do all the things an insurer normally does. Collect premiums from workers, pay the bills, and be fiscally responsible, like making sure they don't overpay any of those bills. We're talking about billions of healthcare dollars these big companies oversee, right? And if it goes badly, it's their assets on the line? Is that what this is? Yeah, that's what is so surprising about this. I mean, employers are entrusting all that money, outsourcing all that responsibility to these outside companies called third-party administrators or TPAs. This sounds pretty risky. Like, why do this in the first place? Because it's super complicated to run a health plan. But really, employers want the benefits that come with that. It can be a whole lot cheaper. They get out of most state insurance regulations. Plus, they get more control over the insurance plan itself. They set the co-pays, make telehealth free, whatever they want. And, and why would a big insurer like Aetna want to be a TPA? Don't they have their own book of business to worry about? Turns out this is a huge book of that business, Dan. The large insurance companies like Aetna, Cigna, United Healthcare all love to act as a third party administrator. It's, it's a very good business and uh, it's safer than being in the insurance business, right? That's Ken Yonda, who spent 40 years working as an insurance executive. Ken says in a traditional contract, it's the insurer who's financially exposed, meaning if a bunch of people get sick, the insurer is on the hook to cover all the bills. As a TPA, not their problem. It's the employer who gets whacked. So in these administrative contracts, insurers are just very well-paid managers. Basically, and the country's biggest health insurers do the bulk of TPA work for large employers. You know, part of my spelunking adventure took me deep into some financial reports, like 60, 70 pages long. Oh, I'll spare Lord. you the rest of the details. Please, thank you. <laughs> no problem. And as best as I could tell, Cigna, Aetna, and United collectively made more than $20 billion last year off this administrative business. And Dan, those companies served more than 40 million Americans through these contracts. People like Sandy Peters. Yeah. And this is why Sandy is so worried, right? If Mars, who's basically handed Aetna a blank checkbook and the keys to the family car, isn't going to catch something that seems so wrong, then who will? And Sandy's like, I guess it's me. So she gathers up every letter, every bill, every little thing she's learned over the last 12 months and mails it off to this lawyer she's heard is looking into sketchy bills. That's the sound Sandy's three-inch thick binder made when it hit Brian Hufford's desk in New York City. This landed on my desk and it basically laid everything out. And it really showed an, inc an incredible effort by an individual who basically said, there's something wrong here and I'm going to track it down. And that really served as the foundation for the case we brought. Sandy's year of digging provided Brian enough evidence to bring a class action lawsuit against Aetna, with Sandy starring as the lead plaintiff. So heading into this lawsuit, Brian and Sandy know there's this extra charge on these bills. They know Sandy's chiropractor didn't add it. They think Aetna had a hand in it, but they have no idea why or how they did it. So Brian starts asking questions, getting documents from Aetna, doing depositions with company executives. Ooh, I like how this is sounding, Leslie, like some kind of uh, white-collar espionage thriller. You're going to want that popcorn, bud. <laughs> so, Mars was paying Aetna this all-inclusive fee to be its TPA. Okay. And part of that job was making sure there are enough providers at good prices that members can go to. But then Aetna said, you know, 
We don't have the best connections on the physical therapy and chiropractors, and we would like to subcontract some of the work, so we're going to subcontract that to Optum. Optum's another major healthcare company owned by insurance giant United, and the other defendant in this lawsuit. And Aetna's determined here, Dan, not to lose a dime. Aetna effectively said, well, obviously Optum has to be paid. They, they're performing administrative services, but we don't want to pay it. So here's the plan they hatched with Optum. Aetna's going to pass Optum's fees on to Mars and its workers through medical bills. The two even agree on a special billing code that Aetna's going to add to every bill to cover up these fees. Here's how Brian talked about it in federal court. It's an unlisted modality, 97039. is designed to reflect an actual treatment for the patient. Ms. Peters did not receive that service, and no provider billed for that service. It was put in there by Aetna to hide the administrative fee for Optum. Wait, so that's how Sandy's share of the bill went from $6 to $14. Aetna slipped it in under unlisted modality 97039. Unlisted modality 97039. Wow, that is some next level healthcare hijinks, Leslie. Right? And just to keep track here, Dan, remember, Mars is paying Aetna to spend Mars's own money and manage their health benefits wisely. So Aetna's raking in those fees with one hand, and with the other, they're flipping through a medical code book looking for ways to cut their own costs at Mars's expense. And this whole scheme, a word Brian and the federal judge both use, by the way, only comes out because it's all laid out in emails. Emails? Are you serious? Yes. In these emails, Aetna and Optum employees talk about finding a dummy code and burying the fees. I mean, it's all in there. They were right up front by saying, boy, if somebody knows about this, we could get into trouble, whether it's the employer or the regulators, so we better keep it hidden. And Dan, Brian told me there's been some similar cases over the years with third-party administrators inflating fees and things. But to see this level of scheming so blatantly in the open was shocking, even for him. Though I will say, the first court to hear this case actually ruled in Aetna's favor. The judge was persuaded because Optum did have a cheaper network of chiropractors and physical therapists. And overall, the arrangement saved Mars and its workers money. A classic, the ends justifies the means kind of ruling. Precisely. But then earlier this summer, a federal appeals court reversed most of the original decision, ruled that Aetna had, quote, unjustly enriched itself. By how much? Well, the lower court needs to rehear the case, but Brian estimates Aetna could be forced to return up to $15 million in excess fees to thousands of workers, Mars, and some other employers. So just to summarize, the Fourth Circuit found that two of America's biggest healthcare companies colluded to basically pick a dollar here, take a dollar there, out of the pockets of workers, retirees, and employers to the tune of up to $15 million? That about sums it up. We reached out to both companies. Aetna declined to comment. Optum again said the deal, quote, delivered aggregate savings to Aetna and its health plan members. And Mars, for its part, said they're aware of the case, but have nothing else to add. So that's a pretty wild and crazy story, Leslie, but it is just one case. You said that Brian had seen a smattering of other lawsuits in this area. How concerned do you think employers and their workers really should be? So I think if you're an employer, you could look at the narrow scope of cases like this as a relief, right? Like it wasn't that much money. The scheme's pretty limited, but it could also terrify you. I mean, Aetna and Opta went to this much trouble and a lot of legal risk for 15 million bucks. Like TPAs process hundreds of millions of medical claims, negotiate contracts with massive hospital systems. There could be a lot of opportunity to bleed an employer a little here, a little there. You know, it's sort of funny to me to hear this because we know a lot about the questionable business tactics of drug companies, patent abuse type stuff. We hear about the hospitals doing things like upcoding. But when it comes to insurers working as TPAs, you almost never hear about their unsavory practices. 
Yeah, and the disturbing thing is I'm pretty sure no one really knows how common they are. I talked to about a dozen experts, and they all were like, interesting area, basically impossible to study. Almost none of this information, Dan, is public. TPAs barely let employers see their own data. The contracts they sign with doctors, hospitals, and other businesses are usually confidential. I mean, the only reason Sandy's case made it to court, right, is because this relentless retired lady chased down an $8 blip on a $14 bill. And what about employers, Leslie? I mean, they've got so much money on the line. At least some of them must have some suspicions about these intermediaries. Yeah, I mean, I had the same thought, and I actually asked Brian Hufford about it. I mean, this guy's built his entire career suing insurers, acting badly as third-party administrators. He's like the guy for these issues. So I asked him, in your 20-year career, just ballpark it. I mean, how many employers have come to you and said, I'm concerned about what my third-party administrator is up to? Um, I, I mean, none. <laughs> Zero. Zero. That floored me, Dan. Of course, it's possible employers are paying super close attention and just haven't found anything wrong. But Brian Hufford doesn't think that's the case. The employers are just, they basically sort of feel like, look, we've got to provide health insurance. We've hired this administrator. It's way too complicated for us to figure it out. So we're just going to pay that money and worry about other stuff that we can control. And they just don't pay attention. So it took a lot of digging, but I did find a few employers that had put tough questions to their third-party administrators. I know you love a good outlier, Leslie Walker. It's true. A state legislator in Tennessee, a union leader in Boston, and the former head of New Jersey's state health plans, and all three ran up against a combination of legal threats, bureaucratic barriers, and a whole lot of spin. After the break, Leslie continues her journey into one of healthcare's blackest boxes and learns how one employer tried to keep her TPA accountable. Welcome back. Senior producer Leslie Walker is telling us about her journey into a deep corner of healthcare where middlemen, known as third-party administrators, dwell. Employers entrust these intermediaries with billions of dollars and the health care of millions of employees. But the TPA's practices are shrouded in secrecy and complexity. So, Leslie, a question I have is, should employers be more wary than they are? Well, I think the Sandy Peters lawsuit could be a glaring yes could also be just kind of a weird outlier. So I wanted to dig deeper and find an employer who really had kept tabs on their third party administrator and ask them how concerned their colleagues should be. You know, the black box of the TPA. I found it remarkably frustrating. That was actually one of the first things out of Kristen Deacon's mouth when I interviewed her. For three straight years, Kristen, a lawyer by training, woke up every morning responsible for the health benefits of about 800,000 people in the state of New Jersey and more than $7 billion in health care spending. I take very seriously, and I have from the beginning, that responsibility because it's taxpayer money at stake and it's employee money at stake, but it's also people's health. This is a woman who found inspiration in a Department of Labor 18-page handbook kept it on her desk, read it daily, still recites some of it from memory. Act in the sole and exclusive benefit of the plan and your beneficiaries. Number two, any And that handbook, that Dan, outlines why Kristen took her job so to seriously, so which three, really boils down to, to one phrase. Fiduciary obligation. Fiduciary obligation basically means you have more than a moral and a professional duty to keep the health plan you run safe from waste, neglect, abuse. You have a legal one, too. Kristen understood her TPA, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, was there to help. I mean, the state was paying them $100 million a year. But she was the one ultimately responsible for all those 800,000 people, which is why she took a more measured approach to Horizon. I'm an optimist and I like to give the benefit of the doubt when appropriate, you know, trust but verify. The relationship was pretty good, Kristen told me, until the spring of 2019. Her office was under a lot of pressure from the state to cut fat from the health plan. 
So here I am in Trenton with a budget deadline looming, asked to find, you know, 200, 300 million dollars. Kristen eventually gets down to Horizon's fees and she sees a bunch of services the TPA says it's providing. And one of the larger line items for us was recovery services. And I start trying to understand, okay, what exactly are these recovery services made up of? Now, this gets complicated quickly, so I asked Kristen to give us a basic hypothetical that illustrates what she realized recovery services really are. A very simple example would be a hospital in January. They accidentally bill for two knee replacements, right? Let's say it was a $50,000 knee replacement, but we get billed 100 because they accidentally duplicated. But the TPA doesn't catch that mistake. So they pay the hospital $100,000 out of the state of New Jersey's benefit fund. Sometime in June, you know, your TPA discovers that that was in fact an overpayment. And they now tell the hospital, I'm going to take back $50,000 because you only did one surgery and you only get 50. So the TPA has recovered this 50 grand, but instead of just refunding it to the state, who paid the bill in the first place, the TPA takes a cut. New Jersey's contract at the time allowed Horizon to take 12 cents out of every dollar the company recovered, and there was no limit on how much the TPA could collect in these savings. So basically, Horizon has a financial incentive to make mistakes, and the more mistakes they make now and recover later, the more money they make? Bingo. And as soon as Kristen connected those dots, she was pissed. So yeah, what the F, right? Had they been more vigilant in overseeing the claims as they were paid out of the door, then we wouldn't need to save that money because it wouldn't have ever been paid. She tells the TPA, look, you got to bring this line item down immediately. But first, she says, Horizon warns her, you know, that's going to end up meaning more wasted spending. And look, you know, most TPAs do claims recovery. They say it's basically impossible to catch all this stuff in real time and still pay the bills as rapidly as employers want, right? I mean, they're processing hundreds of millions of claims. Some stuff's going to get through. Sure. Plus, I think uh, providers have got to be playing a role here too, right? Like they're trying to squeeze every dollar they can out of every visit and pad their own revenue. Totally. But here's what stood out to Kristen. She had assumed paying Horizon $100 million a year meant they'd do whatever they could to help her save money and deliver high-quality care. Now, she knew it was a lot more complicated. For me, it was one of the, one of the first and certainly the most significant moments when I recognized how screwed self-funded employers were and are and will continue to be until they really take agency and insert themselves in this process. At that point, Kristen decided it was time to get in the driver's seat. Lean into that fiduciary responsibility. Exactly. And she got help from lawmakers. They passed a bill requiring her to hire an independent firm to take over the claims recovery work. But even then, Horizon made it tough telling her the new firm could only review 25 batches of records from one hospital, none at all from another. And to me, Dan, that pushback really captures Kristen's experience in a nutshell. I mean, these are huge businesses, right? With their own incentives, profits, provider networks. And if what an employer wants conflicts with that TPA's bottom line, they're going to fight you. And and Leslie, is that the sort of gold nugget you found on your journey into these deep, dark depths? That's a big one. There is one other one, though. TPAs just don't have much skin in the game. And there's this footnote to Kristen's story. She left her job with the state in mid-August and now helps other employers keep tabs on their TPAs. But Dan, before heading out the door, Kristen had spent 18 months warning Horizon that providers might gouge the state on COVID tests. And up until her last day, she kept seeing $800 claims for tests that should have cost $100. There's an absolute sort of cavalierness. It's our money, right? It's the state's 
and the taxpayers and the members' money, they weren't negligent. It was like, you know, reckless disregard. So I asked Horizon about this. A spokesperson for the company said in an email their contracts prohibit them from commenting and directed me to the state of New Jersey. An official there said Horizon recently agreed to change certain policies, including COVID test payments, and the state, quote, continues to closely monitor performance. So, Leslie, given how hard these companies are to actually oversee and all these other reasons for concern, what are regulators trying to do about any of this? Well, there's really not a lot they can do. Like we talked about at the top of the show, right? A big reason employers self-insure in the first place is to get out of regulations. States basically can't touch most of these plans. The only regulator that can is the Department of Labor, and they're stretched super thin. In a report to Congress, the department said, get this, they have one investigator for every 12,500 plans, and a lot of them aren't even health plans. And Washington doesn't seem too concerned either. Lawmakers are like private employers can hire whoever they want to help run their health plans. If they get a bad deal, that's their problem. And th that's kind of the whole thing. Employers are really, at the end of the day, on their own. I mean, I think that's what's so unique here. More than 150 million Americans get health insurance through work, two thirds from a plan run by their employer. Their workers and retirees are really trusting them to, you know, dot every I, count every dollar. And when they fail, it's people like Sandy who get burned. So this idea of fiduciary responsibility, this duty employers have to look out for their workers, I'm just left wondering, you know, based on everything I learned reporting this story, how many employers are truly up to that task? Wesley Walker, thank you very much for taking us on this journey. Thanks for coming along for the ride. There is one regulatory change on the horizon that could shine a little more light into this black box. Next summer, new price transparency rules created by the Trump administration are slated to kick in for insurers, potentially helping employers get a better handle on what their own TPAs are actually doing. Six months later, it's still unclear if more employers now take their fiduciary responsibility more seriously. Former head of New Jersey's state health plan, Kristen Deacon, has opened up her own consulting firm. She points to recent lawsuits filed in Florida and Louisiana as proof that lawyers, employers, unions, and workers are asking questions that few were asking even five years ago. Sandy Peters is still waiting for a federal court to rule on whether Aetna will be forced to pay back the 15 to $20 million in fees that the insurance carrier charged Candymaker Mars and beneficiaries like her. It's been more than eight years since she first discovered Aetna's scheme. In an email, Sandy wrote, quote, The arm of justice moves very slow. Sandy's lawyer, Brian Hufford, told me this week, that's the problem with litigation. It takes a long time, and companies have lots of ways to fight. I'm Dan Gorenstein, and this is Tradeoffs. Across the U.S., COVID restrictions are relaxing. For one of the some 7 million immunocompromised people in the country, it is a frightening and bizarre time. And I feel like I, you know, I'm watching all these things happen, like they're inside a snow globe or something, and I'm on the outside peering in. What it means to be immunocompromised in a COVID-fatigued world, next time on Tradeoffs. Thanks for listening to Tradeoffs. If you've just discovered us, remember to subscribe to the feed so you never miss an episode. Subscribing is free and easy on whichever podcasting app you use, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts. The Tradeoffs team is producers Ryan Levy and Andrea Perdomo, executive director Jessica Silverman, communications manager Nora Tahiri, senior health policy editor Sarah Thomas, sound designer Andrew Perella, executive editor Dan Gorenstein, and senior producer Leslie Walker. The Tradeoffs theme song was composed by Ty Sitterman with additional music this episode from Blue Dot Sessions. This episode is part of a series on health care prices supported in part by West Health. Special thanks to Kate Cahan for her invaluable editing help this week. Additional thanks to Martin Daniel, Sabrina Corlett, Marilyn Bartlett, 
Mark Flores, Aaron Fusay Brown, Amy Monahan, Suzanne Del Banco, Julianne McGarry, Jeff Levenshers, Chris Whaley, Julie Stone, Nell Pizer, Daniel Bird, Chris Skizak, Don Cornelis, Paul Wan, and the Trade Offs Advisory Board. Thanks also to all our listeners who helped to support our work, including Gail Eidman, Robert Wolford, and Deborah Gross. Trade Offs is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Arnold Ventures, West Health, the Better Care Playbook, the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, the Sozose Foundation, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. The views expressed in this episode are those of the individuals and not those of trade-off staff, advisors, or funders. 